This is the voice of Old Business Radio, and I am your host, Jess Duell. You are listening to Generational Leadership. This is a really special program, and I don't remember where the idea popped into my little brain, but my little brain turned it into a really big idea, and I started talking about it, and I had takers. First, my mom said, sure, I'll come on the show. That was surprising. Then I called up a couple of women that I know and I said, who do you know? Would you be interested in in joining me as a mother and bringing your child or with your mother and joining me on the program? And we had a fabulous group. We had two other mother-daughter pairs. Their age range for our group today was from 27 to 92. Okay, that's a 55 year span of talking about generational leadership. And this excites me immensely. I asked the questions, what was one value or trait you wanted to instill in your child to best serve them as adults? And then I asked of the children, what is a lifelong message that you received from your mom? And the conversation took off from there. We'll be right back after this. Welcome to the Voice of Bold Business, the show that provides everything smart leaders need to evaluate situations, build relationships, and create solutions. Jessica Duo candidly talks about the skills necessary to build tenacity and do more with less. And now, here's Jessica. And we're going to just get started. So I have a question for all of the moms here. So Gloria, Laura, and uh, mom, Joan, if you would like, and that is what was one value or trait that you wanted to ensure were instilled in your children to best serve them as adults? This was a very hard question for me because I'm very focused on values and traits and qualities for my children and in business for employees. And the one that I settled on that I decided was the most important that I taught my children, my girls, was independence. I am personally a very independent person. I get a great deal of satisfaction from my own accomplishments and don't require the accolades of others to feel that I have done something good. I very much enjoy thinking, acting, and executing anything and feel blessed that I've had a life where I've been able to do that. I look at independence as a personal and a moral virtue. I think that independence makes an individual a creator versus a user. And I believe that the action behind the value is what develops your independence. It's, it can't just be discussed, it has to actually be displayed. That doesn't mean that you never need other people because other people are very important. It just means that I hope that I taught my children to add back as much value as they take from every situation that they encounter. Gloria or Laura? This is Laura, I'll go next. Top of my head would be emotional intelligence. Spent a lot of time with my children talking about the emotional intelligence behind things that occur. And then by example, I would add being resilient. May I ask, Laura, how you modeled those traits? I think Katie will probably concur that many, many times that something would happen and the lessons of emotional intelligence would come in the form of my saying, well, now what's really going on behind that? Learning to look beneath the surface of someone's outer action and trying to understand the landscape behind it. And then modeling resilience was certainly through the fact that we were thrown into a different family setup when the kid's father left, raising the children on my own and having to make all that happen on my own. Uh, Certainly get up, pick yourself up, figure out the situation and keep moving forward. All right, Gloria, what's a value or trait that you wanted to instill into your children to best serve them as adults? Well, I wanted them to be loving and caring and family-oriented and helping each other, being there for each other through the the years of growing up and as, as adults as well. Of course, I'm a twin. I have a twin sister, so I'm used to having somebody at my side and caring and being part of my life all the time. 
So I love to see this amongst my children as well. And uh, of course, make me proud of them as adults in every way that I would love them to be as well as, as myself, because I use myself as an example. I did have a wonderful upbringing and wonderful parents. I hope my children grow with the same admiration and caring and loving that I grew up with as a family. And I think it's very important, especially with the world today where everybody's at different parts of the of the world. I hate to, to see them drift from one another. And loving each other is, is another aspect of my, my uh, feeling a necessity. You bring up something really important, Gloria, and that's the concept, you use the word drifting. With so much technology and with the ability to be geographically scattered, how do you feel this issue of being far apart, of being more technically connected and less emotionally connected? How is that impacting what we're seeing today in our communities and maybe even in our own lives? good or bad? I see it more of a disconnection now because of the distance. And I personally am very excited with being able to use Facebook Mm -hmm. and Wi-Fi and all those technologies. I mean, it keeps me knowing so much about the family. And if you want to keep going, knowing about the family and be involved with the family, it's available to us. It's a blessing to have the facilities available to us. Brought me closer to people that I never would have any contact with. And family is is them talking about family. Thank you, Gloria. Did you want to add something, Katie? Gloria started by saying that she felt it was more disconnected. I actually think I feel much more connected to family and friends with access to all of the various technologies we use. I certainly communicate with friends cross-country or people that I would not otherwise communicate with on a daily or weekly basis, much more often and on a more intimate level because of the communication channels available to me. From a business perspective, it has made business much easier being at a bigger company, being able to communicate with people who are not in the office. I think that with all of the technologies available to us, everyone has to think more intentionally about how they're communicating via these technologies, whether that's email or Instagram or Facebook or however. I certainly know within a business setting, everyone has the power to email someone else or in our office, we use Slack as a channel, as a communication channel. Everyone has the potential to be able to use these communication channels, but part of the skill and the art of communicating still comes into deciding when it's better to walk down the hall and talk to someone. I think that's where some of the art of that communication comes in is deciding where that line is drawn between becoming more efficient or being more personal and which is going to be more effective. I feel like with technology, you both alluded to this and that's that it's really neat that we get little peeks into people's lives we don't get to see every day that we want to stay in touch with family, friends, colleagues. And I'm going to talk about my sisters and I for a minute. We don't talk on the phone all that much anymore. (laughs) 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we would call and we'd have yap sessions. And I don't know what else to call them besides that. Just talking and talking and touching base and touching base. And now that we have technology, it's kind of like, oh, well, she'll see it on Facebook. Oh, well, she'll see it on this. Oh, well, you know, I'll just send her a text. And I know personally, I very much connect with others one-on-one and in an in-person. So audio video is fantastic. It's like this thing that I can't live without, which is one of the reasons we get to do the voice of old business radio this way. And we're across, we are going from East coast to West coast on, on this program, which is quite fun. Uh, Yet at the same point in time, I'm like, huh, sometimes I wonder what my neighbors are doing (laughs) because I'm on the computer as much as I am outside these days. And I make a conscious effort to walk the neighborhood and be outside to be able to make sure I know who's around me here too. So I find that very interesting. Marilyn, what are you thinking? Everything that we have that's afforded us today is just helping us be more intentional. 
be more intentional, whether we're on Facebook, face to face, whatever it is, we have to find our balance because we love to communicate and we can communicate anywhere. And that means that we also can work all the time. And as far as business is concerned, the technology never shuts down. So we can be connected all the time. And then we have to say sometimes, no, no, we have to find even our downtime. Today, we are given an opportunity to really express ourselves both as a connection to each other and our own personal self. What are our needs? What do we desire? Do we desire to stay in front of the computer today or do we go next door like Jess said? So we are called to action and we're called to really listen to what we are needing or wanting in a moment. You know, is this a good time to work or do I need to back off? And it's up to us. And we are given that, that power and that control. Do you miss being on the phone? Not nearly as much as you were, but to some extent, rather than just texting and emailing and using that technology in place of it. Oh, if you're talking to me, Gloria, yeah, I do. I prefer a phone call anytime over text. Now, is it more efficient to use text or Slack or email? Yeah, it is sometimes. <laughs> like, what are you bringing home for dinner? Or, hey, I felt something weird around and I wanted to just send you a quick text to make sure it was all okay. And if it's okay, great. If it's not okay, I would pick up the phone kind of thing. Yeah, that's okay. It's a little bit of everything. It is, isn't it? <laughs> there is certainly an idea that people in my generation never talk on the phone anymore, I'm guessing, and from what I've heard. And I would say that it comes back to that same thing that Marilyn was saying about intentionality. Certainly, me and my closest friends call each other fairly regularly, and we recognize the value of having that longer phone conversation, and we recognize that there are aspects of how you connect over the phone or on FaceTime, as Gloria said, that you can't replicate via text or email or we use GroupMe as another message channel. So that is certainly not something that has gone away, but it is used for a more specific purpose that is not transactional, like you were saying. And so we won't be calling to talk about something really quick, like planning the next time we'll see each other, but we will call to catch each other up on on our lives and that sort of thing. And we recognize that as very useful still and very valuable. I'm thinking about this now from the perspective of the daughters in the pairs that are here today. I want to know what trait or characteristic that you're really glad that was modeled to you by your mom. I would say in particular about my mother, the fact that she's quite amazing. She drives, she goes out with the friends, she has her hair done every week, she bakes, she does all these things, and she never gives up. She never, ever, ever gives up. I think that's really remarkable. And my mother's amazing. And to think of the things that you would think you wouldn't do at her age. She's I'm still tell my that. age, Marilyn. Well, what the heck? <laughs> I don't care. All right. I'm so proud she of is, She's 92. She's going to be 93. She drives a sports car. You can't, I mean, I have to call her and yell at her because she, because mom, where are you now? You know, who are you out with now? I mean, <laughs> when are you getting home? <laughs> I mean, it's amazing. And she does that. And so it, it inspires me. I'm 64 years old. I got plenty of time left. But I'm also in an urgency mode, and I'm also thinking to myself, I'm not too old to do something. I'm still young. I can still create an empire. I can still be on that stage. I can still write that next book. I can still do all these things because look at my mother. And she's a twin. So there's two of them. <laughs> you imagine that? Two of us? <laughs> so I'm very fortunate to be able to not just hear it, but see it. Mm -hmm. and which, is here, which is listening to me. It's so funny what my mom said for things that she tried to uh, pass down to me because thinking about this, this question ahead of now, I would say almost the exact same answer for what I've learned from her or taken from her. But thinking of it very broadly of, I feel like I've learned from my mother how to understand people in a better way and in a more empathetic way that helps 
both in personal and professional settings. It's probably because she and I have talked about this example all the time, but exactly the anecdote that she shared about my brother or I complaining about someone doing something at school and we thought it was so annoying or we couldn't understand why they were doing it. And her first question was always, well, I wonder what's really going on with them. There might be something else happening there. I think about that all the time when there are conflicts at work or someone else is complaining about their significant other or their friend. I find myself parroting the same question. Do you think something else is going on or what else could that be about? The other thing that I've learned just from watching my mother in her personal and professional life is the importance of maintaining connections with people. And it's something that I'm not as good at as she is, but particularly professionally, there have been choices I've made in my professional life to be more honest with managers or bosses or coworkers than a professional guidebook would tell you to be, or have been more upfront about what's going on in my life or the choices I'm trying to make with my life and trusted that the managers and, and coworkers that I've had in the past will still treat me fairly and come to the table. And as a result, I have really positive, long-lasting relationships with almost all of my past managers for past jobs. And I think a lot of that comes from things I've learned from my mom about keeping those relationships and valuing people as people, not just as the roles that they play in your life, in your life. Yeah. Your answers are great. And I'm thinking it's okay that I leave my laundry that's clean on the couch for a few days before I fold it. I also value ritual and I'm calling it a ritual because it was every week, every week we would clean the house and there was a way we would clean the house. And we learned these skills that when I got out into the real world all on my own and I saw how much nobody else knew about cleanliness and care and taking care of our things that we had that were really important. And so I'm just thinking about the behavior things on that perspective and saying, you know, I'm glad that I learned how to fix things. I'm glad that I learned how to take care of things. I'm glad I learned the power of having a rhythm that I get to do over and over even when I hate it. Because I have to tell you, cleaning is something I'm not particularly fond of. But nonetheless, it's there. It's this thing we have to do. And on a bigger scale, you know, thinking about just interacting in the world, when nobody else will go first, I'll go first. Maybe that's the independence my mom was talking about a little bit earlier. There might be a little bit of fear and there's something that holding some people back like you, Katie, being very honest and open and probably sharing more than I should about anything, knowing that it might open a door and create the kind of connection I am looking to have, the, the interaction that I am seeking to make a situation better or more or achieve the most of the possibility available. I heard you, Laura, what were you going to, going to add? We come from a family of athletes. Katie asked me just recently, how old was my mom when she last competed? We play squash. And how old was the last time that she competed in a squash, national level squash tournament? And it was age 78. And she was the first and I think pretty much the only woman to ever integrate the men's age division, 75 to 80 year old age division in the squash masters national championships. After 10 years of applying and requesting to be able to play with the men of her same age. When she did it, that was an extremely proud moment for her. She just wanted to compete. For me, I was so proud of her. But when Katie asked that question again about how old she was, I thought, well, hell, I can't complain about any aches or, or soreness of any kind. Now I've got years to go to keep playing if she did it that long. That's a pretty good example to keep in mind. She was a lifelong, obviously a lifelong athlete, but despite having had two lung uh, infections as a result of tuberculosis when she was in her 20s, she wow. really, really defied the odds and persisted and just kept going and wanted to remain and, uh, you know, lived a healthy, active life way past when any doctor told her she would be ever be able to do. We grew up with that as a pretty strong example. What is something that you're faced with today that your mom was not faced with that changes the way you apply what you've learned from her? How about that? There are differences 
generation to generation and there are differences. And then I think what you're suggesting is that, yes, there are still similarities because human beings are human beings. I think we all have witnessed in the last year, certainly with the current political climate, you know, remember the French phrase of tout ça change, tout c'est la même chose, and more things change, more they stay the same, and that the dynamics of trying to be a businesswoman in a leadership role requires extra skill and balance, I think, than that, I think, has, has not necessarily changed other than hopefully there are more men who are a little more open to having strong women in le- business leadership roles, but doesn't eliminate the challenges. I find myself in situations that I am like, wow, my mom talked about that. Wow. I hear my aunts talk about that. Wow. I had no idea that I would still be finding myself in the same situation. And then of course, being able to apply the way that I do me and show up the three values that I have embraced to say, this is how I'm going to show up in every situation turns out to be different because I'm a different person yet all of the wisdom that I didn't know was wisdom at the time, the, the sharing of the experiences actually gives me a starting point. I don't feel like I'm starting over by any sense of the imagination. I'm just sometimes surprised. I still am going, wow, I thought there was more progress. And so to me, I came from this place of there's all this progress made. Look at this. The world is ready for strong women like us. And well, sometimes, (laughs) sometimes, That is true. This is the voice of Bold Business Radio, Program 147, Generational Leadership. You are listening to a span of 55 years of women speaking about what we've learned from our moms, what we want to take away, what we're using in our life today. And it's time to rate this program. Tell us what you're thinking. Share your experience. And now we'll get back to the show. I don't know that I can answer your question, Jessica, from my mother. I came from a place where, from a home, where my mother and father decided before they ever had children, they decided that my mother was going to be a homemaker and my father was going to be the breadwinner. That's how they lived their lives. I was raised by my mother with this perception because it was my mother and my grandmother and on and on back in history that the mothers were homemakers. I'm a very talented person. You name the craft, I can do it. You name anything, bake, cook, you know. When I was a senior in high school, I faced a real crisis personally. And that was, you know, you read about this or you hear about it, but I was actually in it, which was I never felt like I fit the role of a homemaker mother. And my mother, she sure set the role. She was like the perfect homemaker. Jessica can attest to this because my Post crafts. Yes. Mm -hmm. (laughs) She sewed all of her clothes, all of our clothes when I was growing up. I hate shopping to this day because when I turned 18, I had to start going to a store to shop for clothes and nothing fits the way it does when your mother makes your clothes the whole time you're growing up. (laughs) And as much as I started having children and wanted, I wanted to emulate that and I tried. And it's not that I failed in one sense, it's not that I failed, but that was not my calling. It's not where I found myself. And I was caught between this expectation that I felt my mother had of me and this whole new world of jumping out into the business world where I felt extremely supported by my father, even though he never worked in a job ever where there were women. That's not the type of job that he had. The job he had, he was always surrounded by men. He never had to deal with women. And so we would have some very interesting discussions, he and I, and it's really easy for him, it was easy for him to speculate you know, how he might behave in a certain situation or what his feelings might be in a certain situation. I had no guide. So I will tell you, especially being someone who once you started to have people reporting to you in business, having all those skills of the mother side of me are very helpful in business. I mean, it gives you many tools that people who have not had that experience have. They just don't have that capacity. But I really felt like I have paved the way. 
because yes, I picked a male dominated industry, not by choice. It's just where I ended up and I love the industry, but it has been. So you broke tradition. There's yeah. an, you, and I'm saying tradition because that tradition could be perceived. It could also have been expected kind of like you're going to follow in your father's footsteps. I mean, that's also a typical tradition. And so if we're looking at tradition and we're looking at expectation and we're looking at the path that was laid out for us, is there a time? So thanks mom for sharing. Is there a time that the rest of, uh, of you felt like you were paving a new path that was different than what was shown to you? My mother is a phenomenal hostess. She's a great cook. She can bake. She was, as you were saying, Joan, a homemaker. She didn't work outside the house. She worked in the house. She was there at three o'clock when we came home most of the time. That was my mother. She was, a, she was motherly. I am motherly in a different way. My mother was great at parties. I love to have parties, but I can't do it the way my mother did it because for me to do it all, that means be the working person that I am, be the wife that I want to be, the grandmother, the, the daughter, and all of the things. I got to go buy great hors d'oeuvres. I mean, I just got to go to the grocery store and buy, and you know, Costco and Whole Foods. And I just really like spread out the hors d'oeuvres. But I love to do the things that like my mother did, but I just do them in a different way. I love to have it look pretty. I like there to be candles. I like pretty plates. I like pretty napkins. I decorate it. If there's not too much food, there's not enough. I just buy it. And I make sure that I do a really good job of it. And my parties are great. There's always flowing wine and all kinds of fun, but I just don't do it the way my mother did. And sometimes there is a little guilt factor, but then again, I have to look at it and go, you know what? When I make a party, progress. huh? Progress. Yeah. Well, when I make a party, I'm in the party. I'm not in the kitchen. There's another thing. I like to socialize. Well, my mother likes to socialize, but she was I in the kitchen bringing the food in and out. And when I make a party, it's already out for the most part. And then I can play with everybody. Even when I have my children over, generally speaking, I don't necessarily cook because if I'm going to cook, then I can't do all the other things I want to do. So I buy it. Then I can sit and play with my grandchildren and do all those things. And that to me gives me the fullness of what I want to do, but I have to pick and choose what my mother did. It's easier nowadays because there are options for buying food, whereas in different older generations, there weren't the same options to be able to do that. But it's nothing wrong with making a different choice. The essence of what you're doing is still as equally powerful. I wanted to follow on from that with a point about something that my mom and dad uh, held out as an important parental element that and then I'm curious to hear what Katie said because I hope that I have done the same thing they were very keen on all of us finding what our own passion was and being supportive of whatever that passion was as opposed to imposing an expectation on us for a specific career or path that was something that I tried to emulate in raising my children I think I succeeded but I'm curious Katie what you think about that I think that that's accurate. I particularly remember that more acutely from childhood of being encouraged to follow whatever the passion of the week or the month was. I certainly never felt any external pressure to follow a particular career path or life path, that sort of thing. Thinking about the questions ahead also, I was struggling to come up with an answer because I think in many ways, I feel like my life and my mom's life are similar. We literally have both worked in commercial real estate within the last two years. She still does. I don't. I think that one of the differences that is interesting is our family has two, describes two different types of people. There are thinker uppers and there are getter doneers. My mother is, and you can correct me if you think I'm wrong, mom. My mom is a getter doneer. She checks the things off the lists. She's very yep. organized. She's hyper efficient and she gets a lot of things done. I am much closer to a thinker uppers. And in that way, it's tougher to compare where our careers or our personal lives have diverged because they feel so 
different. There are so many get or done or qualities, as we would say, that she has that I don't have as much of, particularly in the organizational department. However, there are different sides of my creative brain that I value and I think come from my grandmother and other people in our family that I have inherited in separate channels. So it's hard to compare apples to apples, but I think there are ways in which the get or done or qualities that my mom has have influenced me, but also my grandmother and the way that she chose to live her life creatively, I have also learned from thinking generationally. There are ways that she chose to be creative and share that creativity with loved ones or professionally that I learn from every day and I try to take into my own personal and professional life as well. Before I ask the last question, is there anything on anybody's minds that you want to share right now? I think at this point, uh, probably more of a challenge of thought that I would throw out there. When we first started the conversation, we were talking about technology and information availability. I decided not to jump in and challenge some of the comments that I heard. I guess I would just say to you that more information has, in my opinion, has resulted in a much less intimate relationship between mothers and children, between grandparents and grandchildren. There's an expectation that I see of younger generations than me that I follow them around on their choice of technological, whatever they use to communicate with each other. Their expectation is I follow them around so that I know what they're doing. My expectation is I'm your mom, and if you want me to know, you need to tell me, because I'm not going to go follow you around. I have my own stuff to do. (laughs) I will tell you, I'm struggling. I'm struggling because I believe strongly that there is a huge new, still yet undefined skill set that is emerging through this whole technological evolution. And I think it's really important that we have to figure out both from a personal level as well as a business level how to make all of that work most efficiently and effectively so that you're not losing the communication that you get by voice inflection, by body language, by being able to be a little more even responsive when you're in a one-on-one conversation Mm. in person versus even a one-on-one conversation like this. And I wish somebody would spend more time on that and then just put it out there and go, okay, this is, this is how it's going to work. <laughs> I just think it's great. We can, as, because we're women, more, we can talk about things regardless of, you know, what it is. I think it's, we're fortunate. I'm glad. I, I mean, if I was born a man, I would be fine too, but I am really happy. I was born a woman. I am too mad. <laughs> <laughs> it does make our paths a little easier. This is in honor of all mothers out there, all women out there who are even sisters and aunts and role models in some capacity for others. If you were to share one piece of wisdom from the experiences that you have so far, what would be a piece of wisdom that you would like to share from your perspective, either to the women that came before you because of what you've learned and the differences that you've seen, or the women that are coming after us, they can use both of those pieces of information to look and see how things are changing and how they're the same as we continue through each generation of women coming up behind us. This is the first thing that came to mind and it's pretty direct, but I think about it a lot and I talk about it with my female friends a lot. My piece of advice would be to take a breath in stressful or anxiety-inducing situations, particularly at work, and to apologize less. I think that women apologize a lot when we don't need to. We apologize when someone bumps us in the hallway. We apologize when someone bumps us on the bus or when we've said something that we don't think is 100% absolutely accurate that encompasses every part of whatever it was we meant to say. And men don't apologize like that. I don't think that we necessarily need to move our actions towards what men do as the ideal default. We don't have to 
excuse ourselves for having our own thoughts or opinions or existing in a space like a hallway. I think that this applies personally and professionally, but I have been thinking a lot about when and how I apologize. Not saying sorry in any situation unless I think I have harmed someone or caused them discomfort or true inconvenience. And I think that that helps women present ourselves more confidently and more assuredly in life overall. So it's a work in progress, but it's something that my friends and I talk about all the time. We always talk about whether or not we're apologizing and what that means in the greater society. So that is the wisdom I would pass down to women younger than me so that hopefully they don't learn the habit and then have to break that that habit as well. That's a good one, Katie. I like that. I want to talk to you about that more. But I would add that, and Katie's heard me say this a million times, is it always comes back down to people. No matter what happens in the world, no matter what the year, whatever it is, still, it's human beings that are making those decisions or making those things happen or inventing the algorithms for what we see on the internet. It's always people. And so peel back to uh, who those people are and what are the people's thoughts and influences shaping what you see, which kind of dovetails back around to what I described early on as far as, you know, lessons I've tried to instill consistently. That's what I say to men and to women. Thank you. What I would like to leave behind or leave going forward or just talk about, and, and Jess knows I talk about this a lot, is just listen. Let listening be your bridge. Just listen to how people show up, listen to how they're not showing up, listen to beneath the surface and then beneath that surface and then beneath that surface and beneath that surface and listen to their stories and come with, you know, an open heart and love because in the end, what's it all for anyway? If we're not going to connect and appreciate someone, forgive someone, respect someone. And we can find all of that when we listen. We can find even when there's tremendous differences and tremendous anger or sorrow or joy, whatever. We find our connection and our ability to just plain listen. And listening isn't agreeing. It's just finding that humanity in someone, just giving ourselves a chance. There's no competition. The the ego doesn't exist. It's just a clear slate and a playing field where we encourage each other and it just works every time. We really need to work this life together. And in listening, we can do that. I think anything in moderation, I'm not carrying, can't always be wrong. You can't always be right. And feeling guilty is not a reason for feeling wrong because you may not have to be. I think it's you've just got to concentrate and think about how you are supposed to react to the situation and not feel responsible for having done something wrong if it really could be right. It's a hard thing to analyze because uh, there's lots of ways of seeing something. I find it difficult to say that you have to apologize necessarily for something that maybe isn't necessarily a situation that you do have to apologize for. It's tough to actually set a pattern and think that's just the way it has to be. I want everyone to know that I agree with what everyone has said. We need to consistently set a higher bar a higher bar for ourselves and a higher bar for those around us. And there are ways to do that that are very productive and not destructive, but we seem to be moving into a world of mediocrity being acceptable and less than mediocrity being acceptable. And I I think in the long run that that is very damaging to a community, to a nation. And I think that we each can set a bar higher than that and try to just improve the world around us and the people around us, taking in mind everything that everybody else has mentioned. After listening to this show, I am honored to have seen such wisdom from every age on this panel today. I am also 
humbled by the fact that there is so much information that we can use that we have access to provided we ask the question. That's one of my top values. In fact, it's the top value. If you look at my list, it's curiosity first. What is out there for us to consume? What is out there for us to glean? How do we use the information? Who do we ask? Well, in this case, we might want to ask our moms or our aunts or another uh, figure who is a role model for us in our lives. We're going to be faced with choices that are our own, that are our own based off of our experience, that are our own based off of our priorities. And sometimes they are at odds with those around us. And to be able to make a choice that is right for us, knowing that we might be challenged and most likely will be challenged, that people won't understand and they might think what we're doing is actually wrong. To recognize it, and really hone in. Is this the right choice for us right now? And then go for it. Do it anyway. And I tell you that because this is one of those things where we can learn a lot from our parents and it elevates possibilities. And we can learn a lot from our parents and it can impose limits on ourselves that we didn't even know we had limiting beliefs around. And so the possibility and the opportunity is there. And the dialogue that you saw today was all possibility. It was, we might do things differently. We might find ourselves in the same situations that those before us have been in. And we might do things differently, yet we are who we are. And when we are who we are, that's where possibility comes from. You can find the program notes at voiceofboldbusiness.com slash P147. That is voiceofboldbusiness.com slash P147. One four seven. You can also search the site for generational leadership. Make sure to subscribe and rate the voice of old business radio. It's for us in our lives to gain experience because through our experiences and talking about them is what defines leadership today. It's in our genes, generational leadership. Subscribe at thevoiceofboldbusiness.com and get more information, program notes, and past episodes. Bold leaders approach each situation and focus on action to achieve a higher level of leadership. Jessica Duell, your business advocate, is the host of the Voice of Bold Business Radio. Thank you for joining us.